Thank you all for braving the, the elements to come out today. Uh, we're going to be talking about a campaign that took place in exactly the opposite type of weather conditions. Uh, a very beastly, hot, humid summer campaign in 1861. And it's great to come back and visit this. I Obviously, I spend all of my work hours dealing with the Civil War. My free time for the past several years has been spent in, as the, uh, the British would call it, the 1418 War, as we would call it, the Great War. Uh, so it's always nice to come back and, and uh, revisit some of these old friends in, uh, in our American Civil War. Let me address kind of uh, the, ele the elephant in the room, you might say, and, and why the first Iowa. And the reason for it is really twofold. Uh, first, as, I, as I've said before, in a campaign in which the voices of some units can barely be discerned, for instance, uh, Missouri State Guard, many Missouri State Guard units fall into this category, and the information is quite scarce on those units. The first Iowa is blessed with a great deal of primary source material. And some of the material that I'm using today comes from the notes of, of Bill Piston, uh, material that he used in his excellent book on the Battle of Wilson's Creek. And Bill very generously donated all these research notes to Wilson's Creek National Battlefield. And of course, I, again, I took uh, full advantage of those notes as well. And although Eugene Fitch wears the Lion Campaign, is undoubtedly the best known volume on the first Iowa, there is substantially more information available than Ware's entertaining book. We'll talk a little bit about Eugene Ware a little later. And second, I would argue that not only are the experiences of the Iowans typical of those of the rest of General Nathaniel Arm uh, Lyon's Army of the West, but the first Iowa was one of the best 90-day units in the Union Army of 1861 for their persistence, endurance, determination, and battlefield prowess. Many of you are familiar with the opening moves of the Wilson's Creek Campaign. Uh, I'll ask your indulgence as I go through those relatively quick, quickly to try to get us to uh, where the Iowans enter the story. Missouri Governor Clayman Fox Jackson, inaugurated in January of 1861 after South Carolina's secession, argued that Missouri would stand by the South. He also warned that any attempt to force the Southern states to remain in the Union would lead to the overthrow, overthrow of our entire federal system. In order that the will of the people of Missouri could be determined, the new governor urged that a state convention be called immediately. The legislature quickly took up Jackson's call, but his plans for the state's secession went awry when the 99-man convention voted overwhelmingly that no adequate cause existed to compel Missouri to leave the Union. Although it appeared that Governor Jackson had been defeated in his efforts to have his state join the Confederacy, he knew that by biding his time and avoiding rash acts, he needed to only wait for another opportunity. Into this unstable situation came Captain Nathaniel Lyon, the commander of Company B, 2nd U.S. Infantry, who arrived in St. Louis with his men on February 6th with orders to bolster the defenses of the St. Louis Arsenal. He quickly forged an alliance with the strongly pro-Union and Republican German-American population of the city. Despite the vote against secession by the state convention, both Governor Jackson's supporters and the German Americans of St. Louis forged ahead with their respective plans. Pro-secessionist paramilitary companies known as Minutemen began to parade through the city. The Germans countered by forming their own illegal military companies, obtaining arms from pro-Union citizens, and drilling in secrecy. On April 12, 1861, Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter, and three days later, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. Governor Jackson was asked to furnish his share of four regiments. Jackson responded on April 17th. Your requisition is illegal, unconstitutional, inhuman, and diabolical, he wrote. Not one man will the state of Missouri furnish to carry on such an un unholy crusade. I wish Jackson had been a little more direct in what he was saying. I'd really beat around the bush with that. Although Jackson's defiant response buoyed secessionist hopes, the Germans of St. Louis and Nathaniel Lyon were determined to answer Lincoln's call. For some time, Lyon had suspected that the secessionists were planning to strike the St. Louis arsenal. On April 21st, he received permission from the Secretary of War to muster volunteers and use them to protect the arsenal and shipped 21,000 arms to Alton, Illinois to equip that state's troops. While Lyon mustered his volunteers and secured the arsenal's weapons, Governor Jackson secured a loan of four pieces of heavy artillery from Confederate President Jefferson Davis. 
Further, at the urging of Missouri State Militia Brigadier General Daniel Marsh Frost, Jackson ordered the militia of St. Louis to gather for training on May 3rd. Frost established his camp on the western edge of the city at a place called Lindell's Grove. There, the perfectly legal gathering of militiamen <coughs> still countered the buildup of Lyon's forces. On the morning of May 6th, Frost's 1st Brigade of Missouri Volunteer Militia marched into Camp Jackson. Captain Lyon kept a close watch on the soldiers there. Early on May 9th, he learned that a curious cargo of marble had been delivered to the militia in camp. Supposedly adopting a unique disguise, posing as U.S. Congressman Frank Blair's blind mother-in-law, <laughs> he was able to leave uh, to have a thorough look at Frost Camp without being discovered. Lyon returned from Camp Jackson convinced that the militiamen posed a risk to the city and the arsenal, and the time had come to bring overwhelming force to bear on Frost's troops. By capturing the militia, he argued, Governor Jackson would be forced to recognize federal authority. On May 10th, Lyon assembled a strike force of some 7,000 men to face an estimated 900 militiamen. The federal volunteers and regulars converged on Camp Jackson, and General Frost agreed to surrender. But Lyon was quickly forced to worry about a much more dangerous enemy. A large crowd of civilians had gathered at Camp Jackson. Some were merely curious onlookers, while others had friends and relatives in the militia ranks and were quite upset at the turn of events. Lyon decided to march his prisoners through the potentially hostile crowd and back to the arsenal. In hindsight, a poor decision, but hardly a surprising one, as every action the federal commander took that day was calculated to impress upon the militiamen and the civilians the power of the federal authorities. General Frost led his men out of the camp, but soon an unexplained halt was called and the crowd used the time to grow more aggressive. Insults were hurled and some onlookers began throwing rocks, dirt, and sticks at the soldiers. Others apparently pulled pistols and began firing as well. Whatever the provocation, some federal troops began firing into the crowd. In their wake, 28 men, women, and children lay dead or mortally wounded, along with three militiamen, while three enlisted men and an officer in the federal ranks were either killed outright or fatally wounded. In the space of a few minutes, the reputed sins of Camp Jackson were avenged with blood, in the words of General Frost. In reality, both Governor Jackson and Captain Lyon had won. Jackson now had a powerful rallying cry to take to the state legislature, while Lyon had reasserted federal authority in St. Louis by means of the bayonet. When word of the events at Camp Jackson reached Jefferson City, the shocked state legislature quickly created the Missouri State Guard for suppressing insurrection, repelling invasion, and to protect lives, liberty, or property. Armed with this mandate, Jackson appointed Sterling Price a major general and commander of the State Guard. Thousands of Missourians flocked to the quickly organized State Guard companies. On May 30th, along with the command of the Army's Department of the West, Lyon also received a Brigadier General's commission. The stage was now set for a face-to-face -face encounter between the two personalities who had helped drive Missouri to the brink of civil war, a newly minted Brigadier General, and the legally elected governor. Several moderates urged Jackson and Price to meet with Lyon in St. Louis. The Planners House meeting, a high-stakes effort to save the state from war, took place on June 11th, but clearly no agreement was possible. Jackson and Price left St. Louis immediately and arrived back in the state capitol, where the governor issued a proclamation mobilizing the Missouri State Guard for service and calling for 50,000 volunteers. Knowing the line would not be far behind, Jackson abandoned the pro-Union town of Jefferson City and gathered his forces at Boonville, a river town in the midst of friendly territory. As Governor Jackson prepared to lead a government in exile, Nathaniel Lyon proposed to take a portion of his command up the Missouri River to capture Jefferson City and secure the waterway, thereby preventing State Guard units from the north from joining Jackson. At the same time, another Union force would travel from St. Louis to Springfield in order to trap Jackson's forces in the jaws of a giant pincer. On June 15th, Lyon's wing peacefully occupied the capital. Two days later, Lyon met Jackson in the first skirmish of the war at Boonville and easily routed the State Guardsmen. Following defeat, defeat at Boonville, Jackson's State Guard retreated toward southwest Missouri. Jackson pushed his troops hard, and fortunately for them, Lyon was delayed at Boonville by a lack of supply wagons and bad weather. Only the second arm of his giant pincer under Colonel Franz Siegel was able to travel, travel fast enough to block Jackson's path. In an all-day fight at Carthage on July 5th, 
the outnumbered Federals were pushed out of the way and fell back to Springfield, and Jackson led his armed men to safety in extreme southwest Missouri. There, the State Guard found allies just across the Arkansas state line in the form of Confederate General Benjamin McCullough and a large force of Confederate and Arkansas state troops. So what was going on in Iowa at this time? Let's go back to talk about our friends, our Hawkeye friends. Unlike Governor Jackson's less than enthusiastic response to Lincoln's call for troops, Iowa's Republican Governor Samuel Jordan Kirkwood was determined to support the President. Although called upon to furnish one regiment of 780 men, Iowa ultimately furnished 968. Kirkwood offered my hearty thanks for the government's course and boasted that nine-tenths of the people of Iowa were with the Lincoln administration. Please assure the President that the people and the executive of Iowa will stand by him unflinchingly, Kirkwood boasted. Ten days ago, we had two parties in this state. Today, we have but one, and that one is for the Constitution and Union unconditionally. With the news of the President's call for volunteers, cities in Iowa held public meetings and passed resolutions supporting the government. The war meeting in Muscatine on April 18th was typical. A procession led by a brass band marched to the courthouse. There, a room crowded almost to suffocation expressed a spirit of excitement and enthusiasm never before seen in the city. A call for volunteers commenced, and there was a rush for the stand to enlist. Many men made remarks. Jacob Butler believed that the war would end in a glorious peace, but the country first must have a baptism of blood. D.C. Cloud said the country was afflicted like a man with a disease requiring a painful surgical operation. Joseph Bilkey, a Hungarian, came forward, said he had fought 19 battles for the liberty of his homeland and would fight 2,000 more for the institutions of his adopted country. Captain Marco Cummins said he, would, he could whip any man of his weight in the state of Louisiana. And that he knew a good many fellows who had girls to attend to, and he would send word to those girls that if they didn't sign, that if those men didn't sign the roll, he would bet they would be kicked out of doors in their courting expeditions. The meeting adjourned after the singing of the Star Spangled Banner and the flag of our union. A veteran of the regiment later honestly recalled that the men in his town listed their names little realizing what it meant and having but the faintest idea of what was before them and no idea of what war was. Frank Bangs Wilkie, a 28-year-old reporter for the Dubuque Herald, left probably the best description as to why men volunteered for the first Iowa. They were clerks on small salaries. They were lawyers with insufficient business. They were young men with no occupation and anxious for employment. They were farmer's boys disgusted with the drudgery of the soil and anxious to visit the wonderful world beyond them. To these were added husbands tired of the bickerings of domestic life, lovers disappointed in their affections, and ambitious elements who saw in the organization of men opportunities for command. Others scented political prefer preferment and joined the popular movement. Physicians with limited practice were numerous in their applications for permission to enter the service. Clergymen with unappreciated parishes, small incomes, and unsympathetic social environments. Young men well-to-do with virile physiques, anxious for adventure, with their hot blood thrilling in response to the sullen clamors of the drum and the shrill invocations of the fife, thronged the recruiting stations and wrote their names in bold characters on the lists. All but one of the counties that, uh, uh, from which uh, recruits were offered for the first time over uh, Lincoln County, so to speak, had voted the Republicans in the 1860 election. This is a, a, a poster for, from Washington, Iowa, for a mass rally right before the election of 1860. So these are the companies that ultimately formed the regiment. Uh, Muscatine Grays, Washington Guards, Muscatine Volunteers, Burlington Rifles, Burlington Zulavs, all sorts of colorful names and their locations uh, where they were, were, were recruited. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, Iowa geography, these companies are coming from this area of Iowa, uh, eastern, specifically southeastern part of the state, these towns over here.
So where did they come from? Uh, foreign born members of the regiment are, uh, make up 37.5% uh, of the officers and men and a number of different countries as you can see there. Uh, the German states make up about 75% of that total. Of that, uh, nearly 40% of foreign born men. The native born, most are from Ohio, but you see obviously a, a wide range of states represented there, from New England, uh, even the South, even one from Louisiana. So again, 60 some odd percent of the regiment is native born, but still interesting that, that a fairly high percentage comes from, uh, is, is foreign born. How old were they? They range in age from 18 to 54. The average age is about 24. And that is in keeping with uh, most of the research that's been done recently about the average age of Union soldiers in particular. They're averaging about 25 or 26, so that's, that's fairly typical. And the uh, oldest soldier there, uh, Captain Mahana from Company B. And the next oldest is the Major Asbury Porter. Ultimately, companies from Muscatine, Johnson, Des Moines, Henry, Scott, Dubuque, and Lynn counties would form the 1st Iowa Infantry. Each of those counties, with the exception of Dubuque, had voted for Lincoln in 1860, and most had voted for Governor Kirkwood as well. Despite the enthusiastic response, in at least one case, it became difficult to find someone to actually lead the volunteers. In Company K, three men declined the captaincy, so at last a committee of five was appointed to find a captain. They pressed Thomas Cook. He declined. They decided on a professor in the schools as someone knew he understood tactics. So they went to visit him. He was told in glowing and patriotic terms of the mission and honor and glory that we were laying at his feet, that the road to honor and fame was plain before him. So they put major pressure on this gentleman to become the captain. After much urging, he agreed to accept, provided that he could be guaranteed $600 in addition to his captain's pay, which was $145 a month, provide for his wife and children while he was gone for three months, and if he was killed, he would be pensioned for life. Uh, the committee politely refused the offer, and not with thanks. <laughs> Thomas Cook finally changed his mind and accepted the position of a captain of Company K. As the companies formed, the new soldiers began to discover the rudiments of drill before they were ordered to Keokuk, where the regiment or where the companies were ordered to rendezvous. A member of the Cedar Rapids company recalled, our first drill master was Captain Snowfer. At the time, I thought Snowfer was the most wicked talker I had ever heard, but I was not in the army long till I found out that after all, Snowfer was but a mild swearer. He would drill us on a sand hill with burrs up and down the hill, and if a man would reach down to remove a, a sandbird, Snuffer would yell out, position, heads up, and let uh, go one of his big words. Then every man was straight and stiff as a gun barrel. As the companies elected their officers and began drilling, they also looked for uniforms. Ladies in each community worked diligently to quickly manufacture uniforms for their boys with interesting results. Hmm. Colors and styles ranged wide, widely with gray pants and black coats, bluish gray jackets and pants, gray blouses with black pants, gray hunting frocks and buckskin trousers, gray blouses with black pants, light blue blouses with gray pants, black and white tweed blouses with gray pants, I'd like to see that, and gray overshirts and pants. Headgear included dark blue caps and black hats. The ladies formed a sewing society, one island remembered. In three days, each man had a pair of pants and I pressed the seams later hearing much profanity about the job I did. Our uniform was made of the worst shoddy. They found out just how shoddy the uniform was when they reached Missouri. One day on the march toward the Ozarks, it rained hard all day. Night came and we halted in the woods and it rained all night. Next morning we got up and our pants fell down around our ankles. Every man commenced cussing the other for cutting off his buttons, but soon discovered that the buttons were paper and the rain forced them to fall off. <laughs> It was laughable to see us hold up our pants with one hand while holding a pocket knife in the other as we chipped pieces of rail fence off to hold up our pants. <laughs> the uniform was our greatest source of fun and chagrin, he wrote. When our officers were trying to make us strut and show off in front of the rebel girls we thought we, who we thought were laughing and grinning at us, 
Our hearts did long for something decent to wear. Uh, Henry Dara is a uh, member of the Governor's Grays Company I, and they are a pre-war militia company, so they had uh, already acquired uniforms before the war began. And this is an incredibly rare photo of, of Henry Dara uh, wearing that Governor's Grays uniform. And the uniform on the right is uh, one of the surviving uniforms, again, a very, very uh, rare and unusual piece. Soon it was time for the companies to leave uh, their hometowns for Keokuk. Departure ceremonies were just as emotional as the organizational meetings had been, with cheering, weeping, speeches, and flag waving. The Muscatine Company had a slightly more dramatic send-off, however. They marched to the wharf to board the mail packet Cape Castle and experienced farewell scenes truly affecting and long remembered. But due to a gale, the boat was unable to go downstream, and after several attempts, the boat turned around and returned back to the wharf. That afternoon, when the wind calmed down, the boat left again. After much difficulty, the packet headed downstream. So it's nothing like having a great send-off and realize you can't leave and then have to come back and do it, do it again. The individual companies arrived in Keokuk, located in extreme southeastern Iowa and close to the Missouri border. Initially quartered in vacant buildings, the men of the 1st Iowa were less than impressed with the locals and their surroundings. One man noted the unaccountable indifference exhibited by the people of Keokuk, while the soldiers were forced to pay two or three times the going rate for anything they purchased in town. Keokuk, in her uh, earlier days, might have been a grand metropolis, recorded one private, no such praise can now be bestowed upon her. Large and in many instances stately mansions and splendid business blocks adorn her streets, but the number of unoccupied, empty, vacant, and desolate I cannot now enumerate. There is no difficulty whatever in finding vacant storerooms, tenements, or stables in which to find comfortable quarters for our troops. Here there is a very general dilapidation of business. Almost everything looks more like de decay than growth. <coughs> Despite the gloomy surroundings, the men found their room and board adequate and fortunately temporary. After tents arrived, the men moved outside town to Camp Ellsworth, so named because news of the Zouav owner Ellsworth's death in Virginia at the hands of a hotel owner arrived just as the Iowans pitched their tents. The Dubuque Grays immediately passed a series of resolutions telling that Western Bowie Knives would wreak a bloody vengeance on any community with such thug secessionist elements. At Camp Ellsworth, the individual companies began to coalesce into a regiment, but not without some tension. One evening, Company I, the Governor's Graves, the pre-war militia company, was on guard. Some privates of the Graves took it upon themselves to clear out the camp's parade ground at the point of the bayonet. The other lads were accustomed to gather there for games and amusement, and upset by the rash actions of the Graves, grabbed their muskets and assembled in small crowds. Many violent threats were made, but the officers soon diffused the situation by ordering everyone off to their quarters. On June 13th, the newly elected colonel of the regiment, John Francis Bates, received orders to leave Camp Ellsworth and move his men to Hannibal, Missouri. Excitement gripped the camp, and the sick, save a very few ill, uh, were at once healed by the great spirit of war. The steamer Jenny Dean soon landed the regiment at Hannibal in the enemy's country. The chance to show the island's true mettle was rapidly approaching. They moved first to Macon, where a portion of the regiment was detached to guard bridges on the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad. Soon orders arrived for them to join General Nathaniel Lyon's army at Boonville. The initial leg of the trip was made by rail from Macon to Rennick, as they were packed into cattle cars for that journey. Along the way, they experienced the divided opinions of the citizens of Missouri firsthand. The temper of the people as we pass them is varying, one Iowan wrote. Some salute us with waving handkerchiefs and cheers, others maintain a sullen, ominous silence, while some show tokens of anger and hatred, shaking their fists and heads. They noted that a very uncommon feature in Missouri in general is the fact that being drunk is the rule. <laughs> Upon arriving in Rennick, the men captured their first major trophy of the campaign, a large secession flag, 30 by 9 feet with stars, stripes, a palmetto tree, and a rattlesnake. It is rather a hideous looking affair, and is a fit symbol of the miserable cause which it represents when Iowa wrote. The march to Boonville was a difficult one for the Green Iowans. 
One enlisted man described it as a long and tedious march through a lonesome, woody country without much water and many of the poor fellows without shoes. He noted that some of his comrades collapsed from exhaustion and heat stroke by the side of the road in ankle-deep dust, saying they would soon die there as anywhere. It was a needless, ill-advised, and miserably planned march, devised, as I think, to glorify a man who made the march on horseback, he bitterly recalled. The first day they had not enough bread, another reported, and the second day there was hardly a company in the regiment that had a bite to eat. Nothing but beans one meal and a small piece of meat for the next. The hard water and harder marching gave a great many of the boys the diarrhea. From the frequency of calls on Surgeon White, he was called the captain of the diarrhea squad. <laughs> Despite the losses, the Iowans covered the 65 miles from Rennick to Boonville in 55 hours. A steamer moved the regiment across the Missouri River to Boonville, where Brigadier General Lyon greeted Colonel Bates. Although no doubt grateful for the reinforcements, Lyon was disappointed in the regiment's varied uniforms and lack of modern rifle muskets. A member of the first described their new commanding general as 5 feet 8, 140 or 150 pounds, wiry in build and tough looking in appearance. His eyes are his most remarkable feature. A sort of stormy expression dwells constantly in them, making him look as though something was constantly going wrong or different from his wishes. He smiles little or none. He goes absently along, plucking his beard carelessly with one hand, stopping here and there to give some order or ask some question in an authoritative voice. The Iowans made a more favorable, uh, favorable impression on the citizens of Boonville, who requested through petitions that the regiment be assigned to garrison the town. Reporter Frank Wilkie, however, was less than impressed when he learned that one of the Iowans had accidentally shot one of his comrades. Many of our recruits never saw a gun before and are about as competent to be trusted with a loaded firearm as would be a mule or a half-witted jackass. Really? In fact, I regard the danger arising from the carelessness of our own soldiers to be infinitely greater than that contained in all the deadly weapons in the hands of all of our enemies in Missouri. If they shoot as many of their enemies during the campaign as they do themselves, they will make themselves immortal for their hero heroism and daring. Regardless of Wilkie's disdain or the citizens' admiration, General Lyon was soon ready to march south, and the Iowans were coming along. Real soldiering was at last to begin. At first light on Wednesday, July 3rd, the army of 2,700 men and 150 wagons headed for Springfield, 200 miles away. The following day, Independence Day, drums awakened the men at 3 a.m. to celebrate, which they did by striking their tents uh, at the double quick and marching off. Marching at the rate of three miles an hour through clouds of dust beneath a sun that would broil a mackerel, the men complained of the heat, the dust, Clay Jackson, and things generally. Unlike the 4th of July back home, there were no speeches or fireworks. The Federals began their march on July 5th in a gentle shower that soon became one of the most terrific thunderstorms I ever witnessed, according to one island. The march continued and included crossings of the Grand and Osage Rivers. They reached Stockton, the first town since leaving Boonville, and found it nearly deserted. As the Federals moved on, they received a parting benediction from a fierce female rebel who hoped we might never live to return. Some soldiers replied that she should dry up. <laughs> Soon news of Siegel's defeat at Carthage reached Lyon, and fearing that his German subordinate was about to be overwhelmed in, Sp in Springfield, he decided to push his men harder. Beginning at 5 a.m. on July 11th, the men made 27 miles, then halted at 3 o'clock to eat. After a brief rest, the march began again. Men on foot stumbled and limped along in the pitch dark on rough roads and through intense heat, falling asleep, while mounted men had to dismount and lead their horses to avoid dozing off and pitching up from their saddles. Others dropped in their tracks and despite threats of punishment, refused to move and were left where they fell. About 3 a.m. on July 12th, after marching 48 miles, the men were allowed to rest in a muddy, dew-covered cornfield. After a reprieve of only two hours, the exhausted Federals were ready to start again, but luckily, after only five more miles, a messenger arrived and announced that Siegel's force was safe. Lyon finally slowed the pace and led his army into Springfield on July 13th to join Siegel and his brigade. The island settled into camp about 10 miles west of Springfield near Little York in a location they christened Camp Mush. 
proud of the fact that they had led the grueling march. When we had left two Missouri regiments 45 minutes behind, with Missourians dropping by the roadside, one island recalled, a Missouri surgeon galloped to the head of the column and warned Lyon that he would kill all the Missouri men if he didn't halt. Lyon agreed to stop. The men got their supper of crackers and coffee, and that evening, to the surprise of everyone, the Iowans conducted a skirmish drill. It was at this point that Lyon, who had originally called them gypsies due to their varied and ragged appearance, supposedly hotly explained, if there isn't those damned Iowa Greyhounds on the skirmish drill. And a new nickname was born. The Greyhounds spent the next 10 days in camp near Springfield as Lyon pleaded with his superiors for reinforcements, tried to feed his army, gathered intelligence, and pondered his next move. Fighting rations for the army proved increasingly difficult. Inadequate supplies arrived from Rolla, so the Federals ate up the surrounding countryside. Rations became monotonous. Complaints about hard crackers led to the issuance of mush, and soon everybody got sick on mush. Boiled, fried, roasted, stewed cornmeal. The rations prompted one Iowa wag to compose Hard Crackers Come Again No More, a parody of the Stephen Foster hit, Hard Times Come Again No More. Want me to sing it, I will later. You don't want that. It's a great song. When word arrived that the State Guard had established a marshaling area and supply depot at Forsyth, about 50 miles southeast of Springfield, Lyon ordered Captain Thomas Sweeney to take 1,200 men, including six companies of the 1st Iowa, to break up the State Guard camp. Once again, the Federals suffered through the heat and dust and the obligatory thunderstorm, as if the Indian Ocean had been upset on us, reported uh, Frank Wilkie. The next day, they marched 33 miles in 11 hours, waded streams from knee to waist deep. One meandering stream they crossed 10 times, with the men's feet cut by sharp stones, leaving tracks of blood. The entire 63 miles was made in three days. On the afternoon of July 22nd, the Federals approached Forsyth and jogged the final four miles on the double quick. They charged into town with a yell. About 75 state guardsmen put up a brief fight, but soon retreated. Their first skirmish impressed all of Captain Sweeney's command. The effect of the booming of the cannon, the crashing of the bombs and canister and grape through the trees over our heads, wrote one Federal, the falling branches and the constant and rapid discharge of small arms, we will none of us soon forget, but the boys all stood firm. Frank Wilkie went to investigate the county courthouse in the center of town, but unknown to the correspondent, the young lieutenant in command of the expedition's artillery, misunderstood his orders and commenced shelling the courthouse. Wilkie narrowly avoided being killed by one round and left the building with a severe head wound from which the blood ran in streams. The Iowans were disappointed by the short duration of the fighting, but they were proud of their accomplishment for they had demonstrated that they were not holiday soldiers. Very soon they would all experience a much larger and far more deadly encounter with the enemy. By the time the Iowans returned to Lyon and Springfield, the supply situation had become desperate. Not only were rations short, but now clothing was even harder to come by. A man identified as WFD described the Army's plight in this letter home. Looking long over our company's ranks gives a fine illustration of our regiment. Some with bare feet, blistered and scalded. Some with shoes without heels or toes. Others without sides or soles. Boots cut down and cut for the accommodation of blisters and corns. Trousers with original seats gone. A few replaced with carpeting, coffee sacks, or flannel. Others with fronts of legs gone, presenting the lining in a singular contrast with the original goods. Others worn out around the feet, inside of the legs, and torn to the knees. Our men have been compelled to buy clothing and shoes, which are now worn out. The Iowans Island would have only a brief rest after the Forsyth expedition, for by late July, the aggressive Lion was ready to strike another blow. He had received false reports that Generals McCullough and Price had not united, and that separate enemy columns were on the march towards Springfield. Hoping, like Napoleon Bonaparte, to strike each column in turn before they combined, Lyon led his army out of Springfield on August 1st. His men advanced on the wire road in blistering heat and thick dust. The first day we marched 15 miles under the hottest sun that ever shone, wrote Iowan Charles Clark. A soldier in our regiment that had served in India says he never suffered more from heat there. Reporter Wilkie guessed the temperature was anywhere between 1,100 and 2,000 degrees in the shade. And men dropped right by the side of the road as if smitten by lightning. Water and shade were scarce, 
and the sun scorched all animated nature in its way. The Federals were blindly probing for the enemy. On August 2nd, the Federals reached Dove Springs, a welcome source of water for the parched troops. Just to the southwest, McCullough and Price's men had not only combined forces, but were drawing ever closer to Lyon and Springfield. On the morning of August 2nd, McCullough sent a sizable advance guard to probe the southern or federal position, and in a sharp skirmish late that afternoon, the Southerners were routed. The Iowans were deployed as skirmishers that day and again earned Lyon's respect for their solid performance. The day after the skirmish, Lyon pushed his army a few miles further south, but on the morning of August 4th, the Federal commander, realizing that Price and McCullough were united and could move to cut him off from Springfield, ordered a retreat back to town. Lyon's men staggered back into Springfield on the morning of August 5th. Over the course of the next several days, pressure mounted on Lyon, his Iowans, and the rest of the Union Army. The much larger Southern Army under McCullough and Price had advanced to Wilson's Creek only 10 miles from Springfield. Supplies were still scarce, no reinforcements were coming, and most of the Army would soon melt away due to expiring enlistments. Faced with the inevitable abandonment of Springfield and its pro-Union citizenry and a retreat to the railhead at Rolla, Lyon was determined to attack McCullough and Price first, hoping to cripple the Southerners so that he could retire unmolested and maintain the prestige of the National Arms. On the morning of August 9th, the Federal commander issued his orders. The Army would march for Wilson's Creek that evening. As the Army formed for the march, Lyon approached each company of his command and made a brief speech. Opinions were varied about the effectiveness of this pre-battle motivational talk. Some recalled that Lyon spoke in a quiet, soldierly way, telling them he expected them to attack the enemy the following morning and cautioning them to maintain absolute silence. Thus was seen a regular Army officer, a trained soldier, noted as a strict disciplinarian, confiding in his volunteers the preliminary movements incident to a battle against immense odds, explained Iowa Andrew Geddes. Henry O'Connor, on the other hand, remembered a more passionate speech from their commander. Boys, we may have some work, some warm work tomorrow. The honor of Iowa and the interests of your country are in your hands, and I want you to maintain them. Iowa Eugene Ware was far less impressed. He wrote that Lyon gave a tactless and chilling speech, lacking in dash, vim, vim or encouragement, a very poor effort and entirely wanting in enthusiasm. With this last word from their commander, the Federals left Springfield. Colonel Bates, whose defenders said was sick and his detractors said was drunk, fell out of the column and rode back to town, leaving the regiment under the command of Lieutenant Colonel William Merritt. The Army trudged west and turned south across the prairie as the sun disappeared. There wasn't much talking, remembered one Greyhound, for the men believed deadly work was in prospect and were silent as they pondered over the future. The Army halted about a mile from the enemy encampment and rested from 1 to 4 a.m. Eugene Ware was asleep and from 5 to 10 seconds and he slept deliciously, he wrote. Ware had made up his mind that he was certainly not going to be killed and believed that the anxiety which novelists describe and the wakefulness on the eve of battle are creatures, I presume, of the imagination of the novelists, respectively, who were never there. At 4 a.m., the column moved again, and about an hour later, Lyon skirmishers encountered hungry southern foragers who had wandered off from the Wilson's Creek encampment in search of breakfast. The battle was on. Lyon enjoyed a great deal of initial success as his men drove the enemy opposition at the northern end of the encampment and swept up to the crest of a height that would soon become known as Bloody Hill. There, fixed in place largely by southern artillery, uh, artillery fire from the opposite side of Wilson's Creek, Lyon lost his momentum, allowing the Southerners valuable time to form in their camps and move to meet his onslaught. Price's men launched their first drive up Bloody Hill at about 7 a.m. The Iowans initially formed the far left flank of uh, Lyon's battle line, all the way over here. near the eastern slope of Bloody Hill, overlooking Wilson's Creek. At first, only two companies of Iowans were deployed as skirmishers, and the rest of the regiment remained inactive, their courage and resolve sorely tested by southern musket and cannon fire. The men closest to the enemy were lying down. Nevertheless, casualties soon began to mount. First Sergeant Hugh J. Campbell of Company A rose and walked over to a friend in order to get a piece of chewing tobacco when he learned the call, or when he heard the call, that one of his company had been killed. He returned and found Shelby Norman, one of our best boys, on the ground with a large hole in his temple. 
The boy's eyes were closed, his breathing heavy and slow. This is uh, taken from the Overlook and Bloody Hill looking down the, southern, or the federal line of battle toward uh, Wilson's Creek. And first Iowa would be over here in this dense tree cover, which of course was not there in 1861. Norman had heard a soldier from a neighboring regiment derisively tell the Iowans, stand up, don't be afraid of him. Norman, not willing to let anyone question his courage, sprang to his feet and stood facing the fire. The next instant he was cut down. Campbell put a coat under Norman's head and sent immediately for the regiment's surgeon. One of the bravest and most faithful members of the company was soon dead. Comrades recalled not only Norman's dauntless and courageous spirit, but also the fact that earlier in the campaign, Norman had marched 60 miles barefoot, without a murmur, and without losing his place in the column. If you go to the Iowa Soldiers and Sailors Monument today in Des Moines, across from the courthouse, this uh, is Shelby Norman. He was the, the model, so to speak, for the uh, infantry soldier that's on the monument. Really a spectacular monument, too. Joseph McHenry of Company I rose on one knee to cap his musket, but had scarcely done so when a musket ball tore through his head, scattering blood and brains on the men on either side of him. He was dead before he hit the ground. Lieutenant Colonel Merritt, wearing a white coat and riding a white horse, rode up and down the line, presenting a clear target, as cool and undisturbed as though it were raindrops instead of bullets which were pelting every object around him. His manner and voice inspired his men with confidence, kept them steady under that appalling fire, one of his men wrote. The first southern assault petered out at about 745, and they withdrew to the base of the hill, but they were far from finished. At 9 a.m., Price launched a second drive on Bloody Hill. And again, looking down the Union battle line there. The Union left flank was safe, but the center of the line was hard pressed. Lyon ordered the first to shift there between the 1st Kansas and 1st Missouri. When they arrived there, their right flank companies became entangled with the left of the 1st Missouri, which was falling back. To disentangle them, Merritt ordered his men to fall back as well, but two of his companies, the Muscatine Braves and the Mount Pleasant Braves, became separated from the regiment. As Merritt rode to get those companies and guide them to the rear, Lyon arrived on the scene. The Iowans called for a leader, but about that time Captain Sweeney arrived, so Lyon directed him to take charge of the Iowans while the general called up the 2nd Kansas and led them into the gap. A southern volley soon rang out and Lyon fell dead. Great piece in the uh, State Historical Society collection in, in Des Moines. Must get carried by Charles Haynes, the haze that was uh, struck by an enemy bullet. Lyon According to the, the engraving, inaccurately leading the, the first Iowa, he's actually leading the second Kansas when he's killed. Another brief lull settled over the battlefield. Water was scarce and hard to obtain, and the scorching sun began beating down as the humidity rose. A number of men were missing from the Iowa ranks, killed or wounded. The wounded were forced to make their way to a dressing station in the rear of Bloody Hill. Sergeant Hugh Campbell was struck in the leg by a bullet. He said he felt it immediately, Although the wound was not painful, he found he could walk only slowly and with great difficulty. Stooping to try to stop the bleeding with his handkerchief, he called the attention of his commanding officer to the wound, and the officer ordered him to the rear. Campbell went in search of his regiment's surgeon. Amid great confusion, he found retreating troops, ambulances, horses, and wounded soldiers. Refused admittance to any of the already full wagons that could carry him from the battlefield, Campbell cut loose an old lame horse from a wagon but quickly realized that the beast would not be reliable if he was forced to flee the battlefield. Spotting some State Guard cavalry horses tied nearby, Campbell appropriated two of them. When he found other wounded men from his regiment, he left one horse for them and set out on the other horse to find help. Back on Bloody Hill, Sterling Price had asked for and received reinforcements from McCullough in the form of Arkansas and Louisiana troops. At 10.30, the Southerners surged again up the hill. This is showing again that the first Iowa has moved from the far left federal, uh, far left of the federal line, to more or less the, the center of the federal line. The federals now under the command of Major Samuel Sturgis held firm, due at least in part to leadership displayed at all levels. 
Captain Alexander L. Mason of Company C was ever at his post, laboring for the general welfare of his men and for their proficiency in drill and manual arms. Thinking that a musket was more serviceable than a sword, Mason was loading his weapon when he was wounded in the leg, and he died about a half hour later. His last words were, throw no time away on me, move on boys and give them your best. Many years later, one of Mason's men recalled, I have never seen anything so white as his face, pale in death. I can see it now. But the enlisted men were not to be outdone by their officers when it came to displays of heroism. When the islands came under a shower of bullets from a point only 50 yards away, they were ordered to stand up and charge. George Pierce of the governor's grave sprang to his feet and yelled, Come on, boys, let us chase them out. At that instance, a fine-looking officer mounted on a magnificent sorrel charger galloped out in front of the enemy and appeared to urge his men to charge. Pierce drew a bead on him and fired, and the officer tumbled like a log from his horse. But at almost the same instant, Pierce himself fell shot through the, the thigh. Even in the midst of such terrible carnage, the men on both sides occasionally exhibited amusing behavior. Henry Blank of Company A had been excused from duty as one of the Army's butchers, but he shouldered his musket and insisted on going with his comrades to the battle. At one point when the Iowans were driving off the enemy, Blank stepped forward 10 or 12 paces in front of his company, deliberately cut a bush, and returned back to the ranks. When his captain questioned him as to why he'd done such a thing, Blank explained that he wanted to get a better sight of the devil over there. Another Iowan knelt to examine his wounded leg. Jim Grant, a veteran of four regular army enlistments, including service in the Mexican War, stood above him waving the regiment's flag. Mopping his face with his other hand, Grant looked down and said, it's pretty damn hot, ain't it? The wounded soldier curtly exclaimed, yes, it is pretty damn hot. Finally, at about 11.30 a.m., the Southerners moved back down Bloody Hill, their third assault unsuccessful. Major Sturgis took stock of this situation. Losses had been heavy, ammunition was low, and the men were exhausted. Much to the dismay of some of his officers, Sturgis ordered the army to leave the field. As the Federals withdrew, Corporal Lorenzo Dow Immel of James Totten's regular army battery, that's the scene retreating from Bloody Hill back to the north. Captain Lorenzo, or Corporal Lorenzo Dow, Dow Immel of James Totten's regular army battery noticed that one of his battery's caissons had been left behind. The lead pair of horses killed, the caisson lodged on a sapling. Immel set off to rescue it. Under heavy enemy fire, Immel cut the dead animals loose and called for help from the nearby troops. Henry Bouquet of the 1st Iowa came forward, seized a stray horse, and harnessed it. Immel then pulled the case on to safety, and Bouquet returned to his company. Both men were awarded the Medal of Honor in 1897 for their heroic actions. The Federals trudged back to Springfield and early the next morning began to retreat to the railhead at Rollo. The 110-mile march took almost a week, a difficult trek for the healthy, but especially hard on the Army's wounded. How the wounded endured the march back to Springfield and from there to Rolla passes my comprehension, wrote one soldier. We certainly were hard to kill. Casualties had been heavy. Company C, the regiment's color company, entered the fight with 71, or 79 officers and men. The company's captain was mortally wounded and the first lieutenant seriously wounded. By the end of the fighting, the company had lost three dead, 21 seriously wounded, and six slightly wounded, a total of 30, or nearly 40% of the company. In total, the first Iowa suffered 10 killed, eight who died from wounds, 136 wounded, and three missing, for a total of 157 casualties, or approximately 16% of the regiment's strength. George Cargill, a company uh, H, for instance, was seen to fall, but since then missing, supposed to be killed. John Leary of Company I was wounded slightly in the foot by a spent cannonball. Franklin Mann of Company F was wounded in the, in the abdomen by a musket ball and died about 11 o'clock on August 10th in the hospital. Timothy Hallister Saul was missing, supposed to have been killed, not seen since August 10th, 1861. George Tunover had his arm badly bruised by a grape shot. By the time the Iowans staggered into Rolla, one soldier estimated the regiment had marched 852 miles in Missouri not counting its trips by rail. The men's uniforms were all rags and tags, and some garments even less. 
The regiment could scarcely be told from a band of the wildest Indians, noted one island, tanned and browned from the sun with long, unkempt hair. Many men having neither shirt nor blouse covered their nakedness with part of a blanket. Many had no hats, some no shoes, while one soldier's pantaloons stopped three inches above his knees and his ragged blouse did duty as both shirt and coat. The regiment fortunately found new uniforms waiting for them in Rolla, but little attention was paid to fit. Uh, Lorenzo Immel on the left, Nicholas Bouquet on the right. Both wearing their medals of honor. The tall man has the short man's pantaloons and vice versa. Hence, while one has a costume which in exposure of bare legs is a genuine Highlander, another has a surplus of material around the feet that would make another garment. And these are the, uh, so this is a surviving example of the new uniform that they received. Unfortunately, no shoes, socks, shirts, or hats were waiting for them in Rolla. The regiment moved by rail to St. Louis where the magic words, we fought Mitz Siegel, spoken among the Germans there, opened their doors and tapped their beer kegs. Here the Iowans were mustered out on August 21st and once more boarded boats for the trip north to the Promised Land. The welcome home ceremonies for each company were at least as elaborate as their departure ceremonies. For some, these ceremonies were more painful than celebratory. Louisa Mason, widow of the color captain of the regiment, wrote both Generals Henry Halleck and Samuel Curtis with pain and grief too heavy to be borne that her husband's precious body had not been recovered and that a near and dear one was buried on rebel soil. Now she wished his help to go to Missouri to procure it as only she could identify it. She would come if she had to walk every step of the way and beggar my children to come. For God's sake, treat me not silently, she wrote at the bottom of her letter. Mason's fellow officers returned to the battlefield in the fall of 1861 and searched for his grave, but were never able to locate it. And that's uh, Captain Mason's flag, or the color company's flag, or the regiment's flag, still survives in, in Des Moines. Many First Iowa men quickly re-enlisted in new three-year units. In fact, 547 members of the regiment, or more than 51%, re-enlisted in other units and brought valuable combat experience to those new outfits. And here, uh, my, my calculations, <laughs> most of these men served in Iowa units. Uh, some have rather unique service, such as Henry Guerra, the gentleman we looked at uh, in the governor's grave uniform a few minutes ago. He lost an arm in the battle. So he was mustered out of service, obviously, wouldn't be able to serve any longer. But despite the loss of his left arm, he claimed he was a, a, a spy later in the war for General, Union General Nathaniel Banks. Some would not survive. Augustus Wentz of Company G, for instance, became the Lieutenant Colonel of the 7th Iowa and was killed in the Battle of Belmont in November 1861. William S. Brooks of Company F survived Wilson's Creek and Prairie Grove only to die leading a regiment of U.S. colored troops in Arkansas in 1864. Other members of the regiment found themselves in very different theaters of war. Eugene Ware became an officer in the 7th Iowa Cavalry and fought Native Americans in Nebraska, while Francis Cummins of Company A became Lieutenant Colonel of the 124th New York Orange Blossoms and was wounded at Gettysburg and again in the wilderness. Let's see again, Henry Dara, uh, Francis J. Heron, Becomes a major general, leads uh, a part of the force at the Battle of Prairie Grove, uh, receives the Medal of Honor for his service at the Battle of Pea Ridge. Uh, famous Eugene Ware, later known as Iron Quill, that's his uh, uh, nom de plume, as a poet and author, writes the Lion Campaign, again, I referred to earlier, one of the best accounts of the Wilson's Creek uh, uh, campaign. Lewis Kreitz goes on to serve in the 35th Iowa. Great hat, by the way. Thomas Zeller goes on to serve in the 4th Iowa Cavalry uh, in the Vicksburg campaign. Francis Marco Cummins, we just talked about, became Lieutenant Colonel of the 124th New York. He's immortalized in the uh, painting by Don Triani of the uh, Orange Blossoms at the Triangular Field at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863. And there's the monument to the Orange Blossoms uh, 
on the edge of the triangular field, they lose their uh, colonel and the lieutenant colonel in the action. Uh, Cummins had originally been, uh, before joining the Orange Blossoms, though, I should point out that not, not all veter veterans of the first eye will serve without some controversy. Before joining the Orange Blossoms, Cummins was lieutenant colonel of the 6th Iowa, but he was found drunk during the Battle of Shiloh and court martialed. But nonetheless, he returned back to his hometown in uh, New York and was offered a, a, a commission in the 124th New York. George Webb Aylesworth deserted the ranks at least twice and was placed under arrest at least twice, but otherwise he compiled a, uh, a relatively unblemished record and successfully claimed a pension. Despite their later service in far more famous and bloody battles, the men of the First Iowa gained a certain degree of immortality for their performance in the Wilson's Creek Campaign. Governor Kirkwood said the First Iowa was the eldest child of a splendid family of regiments that did honor to the country, and their achievements at Wilson's Creek are standards for valor. Kirkwood was not alone. An Iowa soldier wrote from Davenport in September of 1861, the heroic conduct of the 1st Iowa Regiment at the memorable Battle of Wilson's Creek is the theme of conversation in the camp from early morn till dewy eve. We do not believe that the valor of Iowa soldiers needs any further illustration. The Battle of the 10th of August has precluded that necessity. In countless regimental reunions held well into the 20th century, the men of the 1st Iowa proudly told admiring crowds of their service and sacrifice, and the citizens of the state, although proud of all their veterans of the Civil War, seemed to hold the first in special reverence. In the words of one Iowa newspaper editor, the regiment participated in the Thermopylae of America, where less than 5,000 Union troops fought 23,000 rebels for over seven hours, repulsed their most desperate charges, killed and wounded of the enemy more than they lost themselves, and then retired from the field undemoralized, undaunted, and unconquered. The first was Iowa's historic regiment that first received a baptism of blood at Wilson's Creek and gave the state its first martyrs. And show you again the, the long reach of the first Iowa and their, uh, uh, their ability to command attention. This is a reunion of survivors in Los Angeles of all places in 1914, including Henry Dara, again the gentleman we just talked about. And uh, probably the last formal reunion, uh, really an informal gathering in 1916 in Des Moines, five survivors of the battle gathered together. And these are just a few of the, the many tributes, tributes that can be found in newspapers in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and after the turn of the century, uh, highlighting the performance of the first in the Wilson's Creek campaign. As another newspaper editor wrote, their patriotism in doing so and their valor in battle attracted the attention not only of the country, but of the whole civilized world. Their deeds that day inspired confidence in the citizen soldiers of the Union and served as an example to many other regiments afterwards that went forth. They are worthy of all honor, for no braver regiment ever left the state. And this is, uh, uh, comes out of the, for the Civil War Centennial. Even the National Guard used the governor's grades as an example of citizen soldiers who uh, went to the front, performed well under fire, and returned with honor. Again, from the Civil War Centennial in 1961. Continued to receive special attention from historians long after the Civil War was over, captured the imagination of all Iowans at the time. The regiment had the distinction of being the first to march off to war, so on and so forth. So again, tributes continued well into this, uh, the last century for the men of the first Iowa from those great hands. And I will gladly try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much.